All right, go for it. Whenever you're ready. Can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, so I'm gonna get started now. <laughs> I thought I would had the uh, mute unmuted, but here we go. Hello everyone. My name is Ron Cox and my dashboard capstone project is a real estate investor analysis. I would greatly appreciate it if you could hold all questions until the end of the presentation, please. Here's a little background on me. I served 23 years in the Army, initially as an enlisted counterintelligence agent, where I learned to speak the Korean language at the Defense Language Institute. I then transitioned to the Signal Corps as an officer after attending the Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning, Georgia. Signal officers have a multitude of responsibilities. Basically, anything with electricity flowing through it can fall within your sphere of responsibility. But I was lucky enough to have specialized in information technology during most of my career with plenty of training and certification opportunities while performing jobs ranging from a lower level help desk technician all the way to deputy director of the Joint Network Operations Control Center for Afghanistan where my team was responsible for the Army network throughout Afghanistan. As, as a real estate investor, I'm always looking for my next potential rental property. I hypothesize that certain home sellers, especially home builders, will provide the best deals in terms of price as days on market increase especially if the home has negative attributes that investors want to avoid, like homeowner association fees, high maintenance costs, and swimming pools, which might increase my rental property insurance rates. I usually perform better with a good outline and some basic structure. Therefore, I decided to utilize the OSEMI framework for data science projects instead of the Microsoft Team Data Science Process Lifecycle that was presented the first week of class because the latter approach seemed more applicable to machine learning projects that we'll cover in later weeks, whereas the OSEMI framework can be applied to a wide variety of data science projects. And having worked at Microsoft, I know they like to take standard methodology and customize the guidance to correspond to their IT service offerings. Step one in the framework, obtain the raw data. My project teammate, Lauren, exported a data set of approximately 5,000 rows and 31 columns from the multiple listing service, better known simply as the MLS. Step two, scrub the data. In Power Query, I updated the various data types and examined the distinct and unique data elements to determine cardinality, which offered me some clues as to which columns should be broken out into their own dimension tables. Step three, explore the data. I use Power Query to profile the data in terms of general distribution of data elements within each column before moving on to the main Power BI interface to begin creating initial calculated columns and measures using DAX. From there, I could experiment with a few visuals to ensure my DAX formulas were functioning properly. Step four, model the data. Assuming I performed the previous steps of the framework properly, I then moved on to the model tab within Power BI to establish and in some cases remove relationships between my tables. 
In Power BI, many of the relationships will be dynamically created if you maintain a consistent naming convention within your model. But this can sometimes cause a problem depending on the decisions you've made back in the Power Query editor. For example, I chose to reference the imported source table rather than duplicate the source table when it came to creating my fact and dimension tables. The advantage is that the actual data is only brought into the Power BI PIBIX file once, thereby decreasing the overall size of the file, particularly in cases where you might have large data sets. The disadvantage, however, is that the relationships will be dynamically created, assuming you have consistent naming conventions between those source tables and the rest of your model. So you'll have to go in and clean that up in the modeling interface. The last step in the framework is interpret the data. But I should mention here that the framework is iterative so that you can go back to a previous step when you've gained some insights that motivate you to take to make some changes to your model or if you receive an expanded data set later on in the process. I put together a two page report which I've embedded in this presentation on the next slide. It might take a bit to load since I'll be pulling the report directly from the cloud in the Power BI service. So be patient with me as we transition to the next slide, please. Okay, as you can see, I've broken out uh, the basic aggregations in the upper left quadrant and uh, organized it by the age of the buildings. As an investor, I'm primarily focused on newer builds and those that are under construction that will soon go on the market because I don't want to mess around with older buildings and high maintenance costs. Uh, I've taken those basic numbers and broken out a visual so you can graphically see the numbers that are illustrated along the uh, left hand side here. And then I've further broken out all of those listings by HOA type, where I want to focus on those that don't require a homeowners association. Uh, so I don't have to mess with those pesky fees, uh, nor do I have to worry about what kind of improvements I make on my house and whether or not I have to get permission from a homeowners association. The key visual, however, is the one here in the middle where we have list price and price adjustment averages over the age group. The weak numbers at the bottom represent the total listings that were activated during that particular week. And the line at the top here represents the average price adjustment, where you could see a small drop here between week 36 and 37, but a significant price drop here at week 42. And so I'll be drilling into week 42 uh, as an investor because I want to see all the potential uh, investment opportunities in that particular area. So if I drill down to week 42, you can already see from this visual that it eliminated all but the newer builds. And of those newer builds, uh, the vast majority represent uh, communities that require a HOA, a, a HOA fee. And a small portion of those, no HOA and a couple are voluntary. So if we drill into the details, we can see that there's a large cluster in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. 
and we have the price drop here, which shows red if there's no price drop, and green are the potential investment opportunities. And over here in HOA type, you can see that those with the significant drops are those that have mandatory HOA fees. And I can filter through, scroll, scroll through my list, scroll through the list. Sorry there, get that. Scroll through the list at the bottom so I can drill in on those potential investment opportunities and get more information. Let's see, now I'm trying to go to the next slide. Here we go. The basic lessons learned I got from the analysis was that. Uh, it does seem like sellers with swimming pools and homeowner associations are more likely to drop their prices, so there might be some investment opportunities available there. It turns out older homes were irrelevant during week 42 deep dive. And a larger data set, perhaps, it might be possible to assess that part of the hypothesis. And I didn't have the data necessary to adequately assess the impact of days on market. It would have required a, a, a larger time frame so I could see the patterns in the data. Subject to your questions, that's the presentation. Thank you. Good job, Ron. Excellent, excellent job. Great visuals, great job. I like how you did the script of your presentation, like um, you could teach a Udemy course on the, <laughs> in this. And, and, and uh, yeah, good job with the PowerPoint and, uh, you know, just really intriguing. Um, let's see what, yeah, I really like how your hypothesis was good. I like the OSIMI acronym, how um, you talk about, you know, especially scrubbing the data. I like how you focused on that. The pictures in the background at the beginning were excellent. The background picture where you took the pictures from Power BI and kind of embedded them in, into your in the background of your slides. And, uh, yeah, cool sound effects. I was having fun. So this part, when you mentioned here with Power Query Editor, so he, now this part, okay, here. So in Power Query Editor, you you cannot put DAX in Power Query Editor. So this part again, what do you mean about Power Query Editor and, and DAX here in this in this slide? Oh, the, the intent uh, here was I, I did the screenshot of the Power Query Editor, right? Was the first part of my exploration where you can see the general distribution of the data using the uh, that one tab that shows the distribution of the data at the bottom when you highlight a column. And the visuals at the top, when you could see whether there's errors in there and a, a smaller distribution. Mm -hmm. But also, I explored the data by creating uh, initial measures and calculated columns so I could kind of see. Um, if, if I were doing a data science project outside of Power BI, let, let's say I was using R programming or, or Python, when you do the exploratory data analysis, there's commands that you can use that will basically look at the data and give you a nice little grid of the max, the, the min, the average. Uh, it'll look at all the categorical data and show you, you know, how many different categ distinct categories you have. In order to do all of that in Power BI, you basically have to go to two different places. And, and so that was the intent there to say I had to look both in the Power Query Editor as well as uh, come over and create some basic measures in DAX to, to be able to explore. That's, not, that's great. Maybe, so some of these, I mean, it's maybe a minor suggestion, maybe put a space in between after the raw data, maybe just a small space for, for that little paragraph of words. I mean, it's a minor, you know, just a minor thing of, Maybe just 
having a few uh, some bullet point instead of that par- small paragraph maybe just two bullet right. points instead um but but the pictures were excellent um yeah and i mean th- and did you make a dax table too did you uh, create um, a dax hold table on, let, me, let, let me exit this show real quick and pull my raw slide all right thanks thing. uh what were you asking me now yeah did you make did a I... dax table using a dax because i know you have a calculated column and measures oh, yeah. yes hold on I mean, I you don't have to show it to i was just just oh wondering I, I, my if calculated if um my my dax table was my actual date table so i used the um the calendar the auto calendar feature to basically look at all the different dates in my model and generate that table. And then I had a variety of calculated columns so I could do some date math, figure out um, how long uh, a particular listing was on the market and things of that nature. That's great. Yeah, good job again with this. The, all these presentations, you know, it's you all can see that hopefully you're getting tips on um, on how you all can uh, can present and, and make these uh, make your presentations better. And then yeah. I don't know if you still wanted me to do it before we drill into the feedback, but I had it queued up because you had asked me previously to show everyone how I built my PowerPoint presentation how I exported it from Word into PowerPoint. So I could do that after we sure. do the, the Q&A or the feedback. You can now, since you're just, since you're on the slide or since you're at this okay. place. And... So if you build the, the Word document uh, properly with the appropriate tags, so each slide header uh, needs to be at, at header one, Right, that that changes it a different color in Microsoft Word. And you open the document in Microsoft Word online because the feature won't work in the desktop to export. When you're doing the desktop, you can pull it in from from PowerPoint. But if you want to push it in from Word, you have to use the online service and you go to file, export, it's still in preview, so uh, I'm looking forward to when it's uh, in production. It should do a lot better, but you, you see it gives you a few themes. And you can kind of scroll through and pick one. So let's pick this one is different than the theme I chose. It prepares the slides for you and it'll open it up in PowerPoint online. Because I told you before, I'm not good at making things look pretty. So I let the artificial intelligence do all the work for me. So it'll apply a theme to all your slides based on the format in your Word document. And if you want to change a particular slide, let's say I go to slide two and I don't like the way that's laid out, the designer has a variety of other options for that specific slide. So if I wanted to kick it over to there, and you basically just kind of go through and pick the best one you want. And then you can drop your pictures in later. And so that'll save people quite a bit of time. And if they're like me and they don't know how to make things look pretty on their own, they can use the modern technology and allow artificial intelligence to do the bulk of the work. Yeah, thanks for showing us that. Yeah, because I've seen, yes. you know, in PowerPoint, you could do like file and open a Word document in PowerPoint, I think, to bring a Word document into PowerPoint. But yeah, that's, yeah, that's you can, really you cool. You can pull in a, a Word outline. It, it's, it's a similar process, but this one is definitely fancier and gives you more options if you do it on the online version. Yeah, okay, we'll have to, yeah, everyone can try that out. Awesome. Yeah, because a lot easier to type in Word than than PowerPoint is for sure. Yes, sir. Okay, yeah, any other feedback from the audience here? Great job, Ron. Thank you.
it was a good pre yeah, presentation. Oh, it was a good presentation. I, I was sitting back and I was like, when you said when you said real estate, I was like, oh, here, let me listen because I'm I'm all, I'm all about listening and I'm learning about real estate. But it was it was definitely well put together and with the with all the effects and everything that you had in there, it kept it kept me wanting to listen and wanting to learn more. So it was definitely a great presentation. Thank you, sir. Um, I want to say this, Ron, because I find that it's unique out of our group. The fact that you and Lauren went and totally created your own data set. From a random idea, I believe that you and Lauren should be applauded for that. You know, we're not here to compare, you know, with one another, but definitely recognize when someone goes uh, outside of the of the regular routine to do something. And so, you know, well done for you and Lauren to have the mindset to say, you know what, this is what I'm interested in. Let me build something around this. Speaks volumes. Well done. Thanks. Yeah, we're all great, y'all. We're all great. <laughs> one thing I was going to mention when I, I kind of stutter stepped at the beginning of the presentation is when I went into uh, slide presentation mode, it shrank the Teams window and it gave me a little rectangle of you, Jeremy, but it put it right on top of my script, the bottom part of my script. And I was afraid to try and move it because I thought I might shut down sharing or whatnot. So I could read the first part of the script, <laughs> but then I had to like ad lib on the second part on every slide because I didn't want to touch the box. I thought I might hit the wrong thing, but now I know I could just move it out of the way. Oh, with the when you minimize, oh, it minimizes, I guess it minimizes teams. Um, yeah, I mean, really. And I don't, you know, you know me, I don't, I don't present a lot in PowerPoint through Teams, more demos. So, um, yeah. So, well, I, you the know, the, yeah, the go funny ahead. thing is I, I had basically rehearsed everything else, but what I didn't rehearse was actually presenting in Teams. I, re, I rehearsed the slide presentation, the script and everything else, but then... <laughs> The one thing I didn't rehearse was was, you know, posted it into uh, the channel for me and Lauren, even if she wasn't in there, I would have at least seen that it created that little box. Yeah, so that's a good point to remember. Yeah, you all can practice future presentations and, and just a team's meeting like that again. But yeah, good job. Good job practicing. Excellent. Any other feedback, uh, comments? I guess one one I'm thinking, you know, it's really cool to look at the data and you see, I guess the new the new home builds, it shows that they're probably building them in areas with a uh, um, swimming pool, community pool, sidewalk, so they can charge that HOA fee, right? Compared to, you know, if you look in the uh, outskirts of town in the countryside with no, um, you know, no pool, no sidewalk, they can't charge HOA fee. So yeah, it's, a, you know, there's a, important things to look at and um yeah like you said it shows that you know how they just some of those you know shows that they're just trying to of course get more fees make more money to, uh, in that area yeah and i could tell you as a real estate investor um it's it's nice having those amenities in a community but there are plenty of i mean an overwhelming number of stories of mismanaged Oh, uh, management companies, you know, they, they take in all this money and in some instances you get very little for your money and it becomes so problematic anytime you want to make an improvement to the property to increase the value so I can thereby increase uh, my rents so I can make more money, which is the objective. And, and they just make you go through so much paperwork and it's sometimes it's, it's just the hassle. Yeah, like you said, 
<laughs> yeah, and you have to deal dealing with the HOA people or HOA uh, uh, community community and all that stuff. But it is funny through the analysis you could see a significant number of the price drops came from those communities with a mandatory HOA because they know that no one really wants to be in a homeowners association. So they had to drop those prices. Yeah, that's good analysis. Yeah, any other comments? Okay, I'm gonna stop there. Thanks, guys.